Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wade Colt, president of the Rotary Club of Greenville. It's great to see you all here today for our last meeting of the month of May. I hope you know a little bit more about the academic histories of the people around the table. I told my table, I, as I mentioned to you, I still remember what our speaker said. He encouraged us. It's always important, he said, to have leaders in any organization, but you also need to have ennobling followers who encourage the leader and help shape his or her vision and mission and how they go about exercising their leadership. And that, I don't think I knew what the word ennobling meant at the time, so that's why it's stuck in my head. But anyway, uh, thank you for being here. We had a number of people at Discover Rotary this morning led by Beth Paget. I think three or four of those guests are with us, so a particular welcome to you. Thank you for spending some time with the Rotary Club of Greenville, and we do want to encourage your interest in us. And I would like to start our formal program by inviting Bert Strange up to lead us in the invocation and pledge. Will you stand, please? Let us pray. Holy One, as we come together around these tables to celebrate our common calling of service through Rotary, we ask your blessing upon our gathering, our fellowship, and our continuing efforts to do good in the world. As we approach our National Memorial Day holiday, we also call to mind all those who have given their lives in defense of our nation. From Lexington and Concord to Kabul and Kandahar and innumerable places in between, America's sons and daughters have given the last full measure of devotion to protect and sustain the freedoms we enjoy. And we are thankful. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. Well, for those of us that were at the last meeting, I'm picking up for Don Coons at this point, and we're kind of continuing last month's, last week's meeting. But um, earlier this month, Hart had its annual board meeting and banquet at the Embassy Suites out on Verde, and your club helped sponsor the event. 800,000 in awards were given to three teams of scientists from Boston, Tampa, and Seattle. Now, I learned about CART about 17 years ago at a PETS conference in Hilton Head, where a scientist from Emory echoed something that I heard again this time, and it's a little known theme, and I wanted you to make sure you knew it when it comes to CART. For those of you who don't know, CART stands for uh, Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust, or CASH, sometimes it's been converted to. But the uh, Tampa orga organization that I saw, the Tampa winner, had uh, three floors of laboratories. They actively were testing over 1,200 patients, and many were associated with the Veterans Administration, and um, whom they received almost $21 million a year. I'm thinking, well, why do they turn to us for the paltry 250, 300,000 that we were giving them? Well, when the VA and most insurance companies pay for Alzheimer's records, they're looking for a cure now. Most of their insurance companies and their families are always looking for tangible results. While the work of CART is funding for the long term, the efforts being funded on the sh are on the shoulders of discoveries that were done over two decades ago. These people are working on the sub-DNA level and looking for the building blocks of nucle nucleotides, am I going to say that right? And they've discovered that maybe if your grandfather smoked, that may influence the chance of you having Alzheimer's. They're discovering that if in college you ate a lot of candy and were bragged about the fact you only needed two hours of sleep, that may play a factor coming up. A lot of very interesting research, and there's a lot more work to be done. And the people helping us out at this point, and we're a little behind on this, so you'll, you'll indulge me. In the month of April, our, cat do our cart donations were matched by Caroline Stewart, who's been a member of this club since 2010. Now, during the majority of this time, she ran the Lewis P. Batson Company, a supplier of textile machinery and supplies but she spent over 38 years with that company before retiring in 2020. In addition to servicing the textile industries, many of us credit Caroline with teaching, her the teaching us the finer points 
of bulb and light repair up on Roper Mountain Lights, where she led that major funding effort for years. And today you can find her making sure that we keep Rotary Park clean and our membership as and, and as our membership uh, goes strong. But I, I get a kick out of her email address. If you ever need to send Caroline anything, the Caroline address is letsvolunteer21 at gmail.com. So thank you, Caroline, for your match in April. I saw her earlier. Did I miss her? No? Okay. Oh, I missed it. For May, Ryan Brown is our CART match donor, who's been a member here since 2016 and has spent some time working in manufacturing for over a decade with Burrell, a construction company based in Australia and would work with a Princeton, New Jersey consultancy firm. Now, Ryan now is the managing director of Next Level Essentials, an LLC based on Main Street here in Greenville. His company website says, I found a niche in helping independent companies stay independent while also helping companies improve profitability for future mergers or acquisitions. So if you're looking to buy or sell a company, and if someone says EBITDA and you think that's an Arabic word, you might ask Ryan about business performance diagnostics. You'll sleep easier and let's take steps to increase our performance this month because Ryan has to match it. Now, just to, so we don't get behind, coming up in June, we have one of our past Madam Presidents again as our match, Elizabeth Lyons, who's been with the member since 2000 and was our president 10 years ago when her husband and John really kept the lights burning on Roper Mountain. Elizabeth ran the sales department of the Greenville Convention Center for the last two decades, which was part of a 35-year hospitality experience in hotel and convention center, sales, destination management, all kinds of things that she did. Before coming to Greenville, she worked with Marriott in facilities in Denver and Sacramento. Elizabeth has stepped forward to once again match us in the month of June, so make a note to put aside. But let me mention one more time the blue bucket. It's sitting up here in front of me as well. One thing I learned at the convention uh, that occurred again in the early part of this month is the blue bucket is not as effective as it used to be. Why? We don't carry change anymore. We really, you know, some of us fumble for a few folding bills and start stuffing them in the basket. And something that's starting to take shape in and around the country, to, I'm going to throw out to the membership and you guys channel it to your board, is similar to what we do with the foundation. Clubs are now attaching it to a monthly dues. Anderson Club has started doing it there at 10 bucks a month. Just something to set aside and it's something we probably will never get rid of the blue bucket, but it's something to think about in trying to effectively battle Alzheimer's. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, I'm Derek Lewis, and we have a number of visitors with us today. A uh, visiting Rotarian from Abbeville is Matthew Johnson. And then we have several guests with us today, Sebastian Snyder and Seth Drugatz, uh, Steve and Jane Layton, who are guests of John Kent, and Mary Nell Anthony, who is the principal at Greenville Tech's uh, Charter High School and is, has graduation today and is here having lunch with us as a guest of Elizabeth Rosier, and we're glad to have you all with us. So when we started our partnership with Alexander Elementary School several years ago, we chose Alexander because it's the high, it was the highest poverty elementary school in Greenville. And we all understand how difficult a teacher's job is, but having um, to teach children of such high poverty is just a whole nother level of dedication. And so we're, um, we, you know, as you know, we do, we do lots of different things at Alexander, but one of the things we started doing is recognizing the staff member of the month and the teacher of the month. And so today we're blessed to have with us Ray Abreu. So excited I said that right. Um, she is the Ray is the parent involvement facilitator. Uh, we're talking, she graduated in Costa Rica. And so uh, Alexander has a very high percentage of uh, Latino students. And so she is, when I get, I volunteer on Fridays, I read to Miss Malay's first uh, kindergarten class. And so it's always wonderful. Friday morning, it's the highlight of my week. Uh, started out there at eight o'clock in the mornings. And Ray is one of the people in the front office who greets you and prints out my name tag and stuff for you. And it's so wonderful having her there as a resource to deal with the parents. Um, and sometimes she has to do the unfortunate task of calling some of the parents with discipline issues. But she has been, in, been in, uh, at Alexander for two years. 
We also have with us today uh, Beth Bailey, who is the school librarian. And when we first started our relationship with Alexander, we asked them what their needs were. One of them was books. Um, they didn't have enough books in the library. And so we met with Beth and she's provided us a book and we have a book list and we have provided a number of volumes for them. Um, she has been in education for over 30 years and has been in Alexander for the last 15 years. And um, we applaud her for her dedication. Unfortunately, she is retiring in the school year. So I'm really glad that we can have her there here today to recognize her and thank you for all you've done. Thank you both wonderful ladies. Our guest speaker, Dr. David Wyman, is a professor of entrepreneurship within the Department of Marketing and Management at the uh, College of Charleston. He is also the director for the uh, Center of, for Entrepreneurship at that college. The Center for Entrepreneurship provides real life experience activities that, ex that, assess, that assess students in developing an entrepreneurial mindset. Its flagship program, Impact X, where interdisciplinary teams create startups that make a profit while making a difference. Prior to joining academia, David was an entrepreneur and invented over 50 toys and games. His most successful product sold more than 3 million copies. He went on to teach at the Colorado State University, University of San Diego, Clemson University, and now, of course, at the College of uh, Charleston. His research interests center around entrepreneurship and real estate. He is active on community and business advisory boards. Furthermore, Dr. Wyman is known for caring about the success of his students. And today, we are honored to have two past students who have become very successful in their, in their careers. Unique safety clothing entrepreneur, Steve Layton, and his wife, MBA at Clemson academic director, Dr. Jane Layton, both provide their expertise as experts, as uh, professors at the uh, Clemson MBA program. Uh, that said, I'd like to introduce our today's guest speaker as the professor of professors, Dr. David Wyman. Okay. Hello. Okay. So first of all, thank you all very much for uh, having me here. Uh, I know one of the uh, principal things of speaking is to be brief. So I'll be very brief, um, but I, I would welcome any questions you have. I'm, uh, I love teaching, and I believe that teaching is all about being empathetic and having experiential and having questions. So anywhere along this line, um, please interrupt and just raise your hand. And I, I'm, that's much, much more comfortable about answering questions. Um, so what we titled this is Toy Story. It's a little bit of a of my background, my history, and maybe a couple of learning nuggets on creativity. And these are some of the toys that I invented. Okay, does it come out? It's easier for me if I just do it like this. Okay, because I'm, I'm used to walking around a classroom and walking around. I know we've got a little camera here, but that's the way I teach. So it's kind of difficult for me. I'm not a you know, stand behind a desk type of guy. Okay, so see, these are some of the toys. We'll come back to this later on. So my background is I'm sort of a half and half. I was uh, born in England, brought up in the USA. And then my parents had a bit of a sense of humor. They sent me back to England at age 16 to a boarding school. Anybody here been to a boarding school? Okay, so we have a few. Um, an English boarding school is probably pretty different from an American experience. Um, uh, we could talk about that later, um, but it was very interesting. Uh, I ended up, uh, after going through boarding school uh, in England, you can do a skip year so, or a gap year. So I took a gap year and I became a croupier on the south coast of England. I dealt roulette and blackjack. Um, 
It was actually one of my favorite jobs. I loved doing that. Um, we had, for example, we had one guy come in one day and he, he comes in with a paper bag and it's got 500 pounds. We're talking 1975 or so. And he has 500 pounds. That's a lot of money. Okay, a lot of money to me today, a lot of money those days. And he goes out and he plays roulette, blackjack, and he loses all 500 pounds. Next thing that happens is he's very frustrated and sort of angry. And it's a typical British day outside, pouring with rain. And he throws one pound down on 17 black. And he goes out, he says, I won't say the words he used here. And he wandered off into the car parking lot. So I spun the wheel and 17 black came up. So in England, that pays you 35 to one. He took that one pound and ended up at the end of the evening, about three o'clock in the morning, with 12,500 pounds, which would have bought you 10 Ford Escorts in those days. So, um, so that was my background in, as, a, as a croupier. I absolutely loved that job. After that, I went to Queen's College, Cambridge, where I studied economics. The nice thing about England is um, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you know, you realize that England is only three years of school, not four years. So it's easier to get students in and out, a little bit less cost. Um, after Cambridge, I, my first job my, um, was actually working in a brewery. I lasted for about three months. I realized if you're working in a brewery in Liverpool, you really either have to be totally teetotal or you have to be an alcoholic. And I didn't want to do either of those. So I went to a toy fair. My father was in the toy business. Um, and at the toy fair, I met these two German guys and they were desperate because they hired me within 15 minutes and paid me double the salary that I was earning in Liverpool. And that was really the start of my toy career. So I ended up spending three years there in Germany. Um, I absolutely adored Munich. I'd never been to Germany before. I didn't speak any German, so I had to learn German um, during the three years. And it was three of the glorious years of my life. I dated a spy, fun things like that. You know, so it was, it was a great life. After the... Um, Germany. I went back and I did an MBA in England. And you can see my career is pretty quick in academia. So I just did a one-year MBA. Um, and there were two schools in England those days that offered one-year MBA. So I just did a one-year MBA. And then I did like Steve has done as I decided to create my own toy company. And my father had been in the toy business uh, for many years and he'd been a toy entrepreneur, inventor. And he's actually just passed away last year at age 94. But he was really, he was much more creative than I was. So people always say, hey, Dave, what was that great toy you met? And I'm like, not really anything. But my father was the inventor of um, Electronic Battleship, which was the very first electronic toy in the USA with a memory chip. And the kind of cute story with that was when he sold it to a company, Milton Bradley, who most of you probably know, they put it into a back room because it was so novel, so new. And as the buyers would come by, they'd hear this, with the noise, and they'd say, oh, I'd like to see that. And they go, oh, no, no, it's, it's not for you. People would say, yes, I want to see that. I'm a buyer. And so what happened was it sold out within three days at New York Toy Fair. And every time they kept putting the price up by $2 every day because they had smaller and smaller quantities. Because in those days, you had to order all the chips for one year. Sort of like today, actually. Um, so <clears throat> after that, so I did 20 years in the toy business. Um, the good news is I've sold over 75 toys and games. The bad news is that most of them are what I would call heroic failures. And that's the way the life is. And I think the number one lesson I would say in being an entrepreneur or being creative is you got to just throw a lot of st stuff at the wall and something sometimes will stick. And if you wait for perfection, you'll be waiting a long time. You'll be an 80 year old bachelor. You're waiting for the perfect wife. So you just got to throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. I did this for, um, I started the company in 1984. By about 2000, I'd, um, I'd been being half and half. I'd married an English girl first. That didn't work out. And I ended up marrying an American girl. And she convinced me to move to um, actually Colorado. And I was living in Connecticut at the time. I'd moved from England to Connecticut. And one of the problems of Colorado, and I love Colorado, is there are no toy companies and no other toy inventors. And if you're an entrepreneur, I think it's all about networking passion and things like that. And so when I didn't really have, and we popped out two little ones. And so I decided, you know, this is time for me, like many of you in the audience here, to give back. So I did something crazy. I taught 
um, junior high and senior high for a year and did a teaching degree. And I was really, my passion was, uh, like our two ladies here, it was to actually really help young people. Um, but ironically, I got a job at Colorado State. They were desperate. I'd never taught marketing research and never even taken a marketing research class. And they offered me a job to do that. I ended up spending time there. And then in 2001, I got a full-time job at the University of San Diego. Um, both my wife is also a professor. She's a professor of real estate. And that was, for me, was heaven. I mean, I absolutely loved San Diego. Um, lived there. We lived there for four years, just north of San Diego in a little town called Del Mar, um, which is just one of those great pieces of, of beauty. And then my wife came in with a bit of a shock to me. One day she said, you know, Dave, I got an offer. She's a professor. I got an offer from Johns Hopkins. And I said, Elaine, no, that's no good. I'm not moving from San Diego. Anyway, we had two little ones, so I ended up moving to San, to Baltimore. And they say, anybody here from Baltimore? Okay, I can tell you the truth about Baltimore. Anybody who moves from San Diego to Baltimore, there's a name for them. They're called Baltimoreans. <laughs> I'd go to people, I'd meet people on the golf course, and they say, where are you from? I say, San Diego. They said, you're kidding. Really, where are you from? You know, because nobody moves here from San Diego. Anyway, so I, I did that, um, and then I ended up... Uh, we went to Baltimore for a year and then able, were able to escape to this great university just up the road, or actually here in town as well, Clemson. And uh, I had six glorious years teaching at Clemson University. And somewhere, if you're an academic, you need to do a PhD along the line. And so I did a PhD um, in real estate, just like you know Jane's just done her uh, doctorate. <clears throat> and I got, um, and as that, uh, I got an offer to go to College of Charleston. So I've been there for the last 10 years. Um, I'm now a tenured professor at the College of Charleston. So that gives you a bit of the background. I always, I think it's interesting when you have speakers just to understand where they're coming from and as opposed from blah, blah, blah. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just show you a few toys that we've done in the past. And I'm gonna give you a, a just think, I won't, if it was a class, I'd say, okay, what's a hit or what's a miss? And, um, and you find out what you think um, through the periods of time. So first of all, I'll go through the definition of entrepreneurship. My favorite definition is that you're designing, to, you're a human enterprise creating a new product or service under conditions of uncertainty. And I don't think we've ever lived in a world in our lifetimes that's more uncertain than today. You know, with everything that's happening between COVID, politics, you know, Ukraine. I mean, there's just a lot of climates. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Um, we find that, for example, 60% of all undergraduates um, actually have mental stress. You know, when I was uh, an undergraduate, you know, our, our mental stress was, could we afford to buy a beer? You know, they have different mental stresses today. So it's a little bit different today you know, as you work with the young people. The other part of um, entrepreneurship, I believe the greatest part is you have to be really creative. Because if you just create something somebody's already done before, there's no reason for you to exist. Um, so you've always got to come up with new ideas and life in the lifeline of an entrepreneur is coming up with something new, different all the time. So <clears throat> wiser people than me to say that the three key things are inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Inspiration is kind of cool because you get inspiration. Most people get really great ideas by doing things like taking showers, taking walks. You really don't get inspiration normally by just sitting at your computer. Okay. Ideation is what I was talking about before is if you want to be an entrepreneur or a creative, you really have to throw lots and lots of, you know, stuff at the wall until you see what sticks. Um, and then implementation is you actually got to get up there and do that. And that for most of us is probably the hardest part, actually executing. We, a lot of people say, I had that great idea and they've done that. All right. Well, that's because you didn't implement, you didn't execute. Okay. You got to get out of the chair and actually do it. And Hats off to Steve and Jane, because you know, they just started a new company six months ago and are already making a success out of that. So that's really cool. It's that really get up and go and everything like that, because it's pretty easy to be comfortable. And I think the greatest definition of an entrepreneur is being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay, so that's for me. So my question for you is, I'll show you about half a dozen toys, is what is success for you? Think about it. what is success for you? And we heard 
you know, some uh, from birth, some earlier on, you know, his success from one of his teachers was, you know, helping enabling the future generations and things like that, and learning to be a follower as well as a leader, okay? If you look at most people's success is, hey, I want to, I'll be really successful when I make a million dollars. I'll be really successful when I build a house on Lake Kiwi. I'll be really successful when I have a single digit handicap. I'll be really successful when my kids graduate from school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you discover is one of the most successful human beings is Michael Phelps. So his success was he won 25 gold medals. So anybody know what happened after that? He wanted to commit suicide. He wanted to commit suicide. So success is very lingering. And the truth for me, the true and for wiser people, the true meaning of success is that you got to keep going. Your achievements are all in your past. It's what you're doing in the future is what success is all about. And how, as Bert was saying, how you enable people to do a better future, okay? So here are just a little anatomy of some of my toys in games. So um, this is the very first game I ever invented. It was called Shift Tic-Tac-Toe. And the basic idea of that, how that came about was we all play tic-tac-toe. And once you've played tic-tac-toe, you always end up, if you've played it a few times, you, you always end up with a draw. And um, <clears throat> so the idea here was when you did a tic-tac-toe, instead of getting a draw, you could slide the little numbers or the little bars back and forth. And so you could actually slide yourself into a three in a row. Okay. <clears throat> and the good news for that is that's actually been on the market on and off for about since the mid 80s. Okay. Um, and it's never sold a lot, but it's been sold to a lot of different companies. Um, Pressman USA did it and things like that. And it sold over a million copies in total. So if you think about toys in terms of books or records, that's, that's pretty good uh, thing. Another uh, one we did was a product called Big Wheelie. Uh, we met a company called Empire Toys. And what Empire said is, hey, we're looking to do a new big wheel. So we came in with like 40 different drawings. What about this? No. What about that? Mm -mm. What about this? Mm -mm. Anyway, and we finally showed them an idea. You know, and the idea was everybody loves the Papa Wheelie on their bicycle. Why not Papa Wheelie on a big wheelie? And so we did this and they, uh, the company, it was great, you know, um, did really well. They sold a quarter of a million pieces in the first year and they had had a great TV commercial, you know, a little song, Big Wheelie, you know, and it was really fun. The next year, what happened was, and um, we're so excited and everything like that. Next year, and this is the story of the toys. The next year they um, bought another company, like Marshawn, which was a road racing set. And the guy who ran the factory passed away. So all the tools to make all the road racing sets got put into their central manufacturing spot. And so they were not able to manufacture any of the Marshawn toys, but also none of their own toys. So the guy who ran the company, Steve Geller, he said, I lost $25 million in the space of two months because he was not able to do Christmas. And the bad news for us is that product also died as a result of that. Um, so it was a good product, but not good enough, you know. That was Big Wheelie. The third product uh, we did was uh, in London, when I lived around in London uh, for about 20 years. When you lived in London, you, there's a thing called the M25. And the M25 just takes about 25 years to go around London. It's terrible, okay? And so I I'd just seen the movie Mad Max and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could just bump a guy off, you know, not socially uh, constructive, bump a guy off here, bump a guy off there and move faster. And so that was the inspiration behind Road Wars. The good news for this is when you go to Toy Fair, they have companies like Mattel, they have this big inventor's night and where they have all, you get to see all the inventions of everything that's happened in the toy industry. And they had this really about the buffet size table there with Road Wars. And they had a guy all dressed up like Mad Max, they had TV commercials. You know, my buddies were all like, oh, Dave, you know, where are you gonna go live? Uh, Island in the Caribbean, things like that. So that was the good news. The bad news was two months later, my wife, now she's a business professor. She comes in, but she's from a family of nine. And she comes in, look, look, I got two for the price of one. I said, oh no, honey. That's bad news. That's really bad news. That means it's already on sale. And, and so that was um, a flop. Um, you can see 
uh, and I can promise you that we were no inspiration for this, but they, we actually had the Statue of Liberty blew up in this game. And so obviously this is predated 9-11. So, um, so um, that was Road Wars. The next one was uh, we were doing a lot of you know, boy games and men games because that's just the nature of a lot of the inventors tend to be men. And we recognize that we have half the audience is women. You know? So we decided to do a women adventure game and we called it the White Unicorn. And one of my friends who's actually runs a toy store, a to toy store in Charleston, she said, Dave, that was a failure. I can tell you. And I said, yes, you're right. I said, well, and I said, how do you know? She says, young women or young girls don't like white unicorns. You should have made it pink. Uh, you know, and the good news is we sold it in every country. I mean, literally, we sold it in Australia. We sold it in the USA. We sold it in the UK. We sold it in Spain, France, Germany. The bad news, it was a failure in the UK, Australia. <laughs> so some things are like that. Uh, the next one was we did a product. It's called Baby Grows. And the idea there was it was a little baby doll. And we actually, when we made the, the, the product, you put a little baby bottle in the mouth and the doll would actually, it would touch an actuator and it would actually grow. And so it grew from a little baby into being about a two and a half year old doll. The hair would grow out and the teeth would come out and the, and the dress would, would stretch and everything like that. And we sold it to a company called Playmates. And Playmates is famous for um, finding new ninja mutant turtles, right? So this was a really big foray for them into a new area called dolls. What happened was, but they were sort of mechanical. So they put, they took away all the batteries, all the magnetic actuators, all the hair growing and everything like that. And they just put a crank in the back. It was terrible. It was terrible. So sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Um, the next one was called Fistful of Aliens. I always say that uh, we designed her to look like my first wife. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but this was, a, this was a, a really big success in Japan. That's the good news. The bad news is that the company that did it was a company called Yes, Yes Toys. And they really should have been called no, because they went bankrupt. And you know, as the inventors, when they go bankrupt, we did not receive a penny of the of the Japanese royalties because it all got caught up in bankruptcy court and went to all you know, the tax man, this guy, this guy, and inventors are the last guy. Um, we also, and I got just two more to show you. We also did a game called uh, Radio Girls. What's kind of interesting about this game is the guy who was my co-inventor on this was a guy, Greg Hyman. And I would say I did Greg Hyman's other toy. His other toy, he did many, many toys, uh, but his other toy that he did that you would all know of was Tickle Me Elmo. And so I always go, oh man, Greg, why couldn't we have done that one together? And, um, and so anyway, so this was an electronic uh, dating game, um, but it was not. Uh, it was not really a success. But we did sell it to Mattel, which is always fun, but nah. Um, we also did a game called Calamityville. And the easiest way to describe this is that the sales were a calamity. Um, we did do, um, this is another product I did. It was called How Tall Am I? Um, the good news, it was kind of a cute little thing where you build up a puzzle so you make taller, taller characters rolling a dice. The good news is it's been on the market probably for 15 years. The bad news is it's probably never made a royalty of over a thousand dollars in any of those 15 years. So, and that's sort of the nature of the game. Uh, we also um, have, uh, you know, one of your native sons here, uh, many of you probably know Leighton Cubbage. Anybody know Leighton? So, uh, so Leighton's a good old friend and his brother-in-law, was the inventor of this, and we helped license this, which was Flying Iron Man. And um, so this was a kind of a cute little story. Um, basically, uh, Leighton's brother-in-law has his ability to make anything fly, absolutely anything fly. And so he was like, oh, I got this idea, and it was much bigger than this. You can see he did actually a really human-sized things, but he was getting about 6 million views on YouTube. He said, what do I do with this? 
So me and uh, an ex-partner of mine, uh, Paul, we ended up selling this uh, Flying Iron Man. The good news is that in 2013, it was featured on CNN Live as the must toy of the year. Um, Boys R Us bought 5,000 pieces, sold out literally overnight. So it looked like it was gonna be a really big success. The bad news um, was that the company was called EB Toys. And all of a sudden they realized to actually do a really major campaign between advertising stock and everything like that, it would probably have been about a $12 million investment. And, that, and if it failed at the end of the day, they would have gone bankrupt. So they were saying, this is too big an investment. So they actually dropped the product. Um, after, even after getting that, okay? So that was another one of those uh, misses. And the last one for me to show you today is a game called 13 Dead End Drive. <clears throat> and the inspiration for this game was my sister. So my parents lived in a place uh, called Guernsey, which is an island between England and France. And uh, on the island, um, my parents had a beautiful house. Uh, and my mother was one day, going around and putting post-it notes. No, it's, oh, sorry, my sister was going around putting post-it notes on everything. And so this nice camera, she would put a post-it note. So for her name, Andrea, this, she would put a post-it note and she'd go, David or Steve or Greg. And I'd say, Andrea, what are you doing? She says, mom's making her will tomorrow. And I want her to know what to leave to me and what to leave to you. And so from that came the inspiration of this game where Aunt Agatha passes away and everybody is fighting uh, over her will and one person will inherit everything and everybody else sort of knocks everybody else off in a nice, humane way uh, to see who wins. And that was my most successful product. It's still in the market, um, still sells well in Spain and places like that. Um, and it's been on the market for over 25 years. Um, so my final concluding word uh, for you is when you think about where you want to go in life, um, think about success and always think about success in terms of people, the wonderful people you have in your life, the wonderful people you have here, the wonderful people you're helping, purpose. And we all, without a purpose, I think we're just not going through life. And then also finally passion. And um, that's, if anybody's got any questions, I'll take any questions. But I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story with you today. Thank you. How do you teach inspiration? Uh, I think what you try to ask everybody is, what are you passionate about? And when people talk about passion, I think it's hard to be inspired by something that you're not passionate about. And so when you list what you're passionate about, and you go through ideas, and there's a lot of idea generation things, and I think it's how you tell that story to somebody else helps you. And I do believe it's, we are not inspired by ourselves, we're inspired by the community. I think nobody's an inventor by themselves. I think everybody is successful with other people. Does that help at all? So I want to do one last game. So I've been sort of started working on it in COVID. And uh, I'm looking for that little inspiration just to make it, I, it plays well, it looks well, it's got a nice little story, but I just, I want to do, I'm missing this one little ingredient that, that has the potential, has the potential to become dramatically good. And that's what I'm working on. That's a good. So I am privileged to work with really great artists. Um, and great people throughout my life. And so what I do is I, like, for example, if I came up with, or John and I were talking with an idea, I would say, okay, that's really good. We do really rough drawings, get the basic concept. And then we would go to an artist and get drawings done and more drawings done. And then we test it with, you know, a small group of people and then go from there. And to be honest, after so many years of doing the business, it's sort of like you get a gut feel and I'm really a great believer you get a really strong gut feel. Does this work or does it not work? Um, I'm not the greatest believer in market research. Um, there's a very famous product called, um, if you're a parent many years ago, My Little Pony. When they put it through market research, it was like thumbs down. And I remember seeing it at New York Toy Fair, but my old girlfriend was a loved horses. I said, that's going to be a success. Just and, but that was because I knew she loved horses and everything to do with horses. 
I think there's a lot of gut and experience and sort of pattern recognition that comes into making something success. You know, we do do occasion like that, um, but it, it's monopoly is monopoly. Um, it's just always, there's like several companies. Uh, in fact, that's how 13 Dead End Drive came back on the market because a company winning moves sat there and said, hey, what have you got? Can we repurpose it and everything like that? So I think that's a great idea. It's, it's just, you know, what inspires me is, I'm, I'm as bad as everybody else, what inspires me is the novel, the new, the fun. Because I get the fun out of creating, not really executing, which is the biggest problem. Yeah, and, and that, that's why I'm an inventor, you know, because uh, then I can give it to a toy company and let them go and screw it up. <laughs> Any last question? Well, it's been a privilege. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, David. That was fun to have you here. I'm really disappointed I get, didn't get to have one of those flying suits or um, give it to, to some of my nieces and nephews. I think that that has some real potential. Uh, a few things to bring to your attention at this last meeting of, of this month, um, and these are noted on the agenda as well. So June 1st is our next Thirsty Thursday. Luke Rhodes and Penny Robbins, this is their brainchild, bring some prospective members of that. We had a great crowd for that at our last one several weeks ago at Liability Brewing. This one will be at Pangea Brewing starting at five o'clock. And I think we went from about five to seven. So do come to that. We also have a new member orientation at the Weston on June 13th. And of course, two more Discover Rotaries in this Rotary year. Again, last chance to get your three stickers. So keep that in mind. It's wonderful to have our guest from Alexander Elementary today. Of course, we will be donating a book, which Dave will get him to sign it to the Alexander Elementary School Library to uh, hopefully inspire some, some uh, young academics and maybe some inventors over at Alexander Elementary. So a, a few other things uh, to note, I will not be here during June. So you will get to test out Lisa and Roger who are our next two club presidents. I will be joining virtually, but um, I'm, I, this is my secret plan to extend my reign as president uh, into July for one more meeting. We'll actually have the formal uh, transfer of membership uh, of leadership at our first meeting in July, but unfortunately, I will be traveling during June. But don't start any rumors that I'm I'm giving up my power early. And I think anything else? I, I feel like maybe I've missed something else. I'm looking. Oh yeah, and 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 keep in mind too, we at the crowd at Discover Rotary this morning. We are waiving the initiation fee for new members this year, so that will be good through the end of June. So that's two hundred dollars that a new member would not have to pay. So it's a good time to bring someone in as a new member. Anything else? I'm forgetting important announcements. Great to have you all with us today. If you would, please stand at this time and we will join in the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We're adjourned.